Hello. Welcome. Can I get a few faces? Happy birthday. I wish the power was good. The letter. I'll call this back to order and we'll deal with um, number two, Council of Governance Model Review. Okay. Proposed recommendations from the City Administration. So, Your Worship, um, we prepared this following the survey we did of, of directors and council members in uh, August of last year. Uh, it does reflect uh, the administration's perspective on a number of issues. Uh, sort of four um, themes that we approached this exercise with were to support council's ownership and direction over its policy agenda, to find clear roles for both council members and the administration, make efficient use of council's time and the administration's resources, and provide focused opportunities for the public to engage and advise council. So you, those themes are sort of embedded in the recommendations that come before you. Uh, the yellow items are, are the items we're asking you to focus your attention on because they do suggest change to the current model. Uh, the white uh, items simply are a, a check-in on an existing policy or practice. The first grouping relates to standing committees, and these do reflect back on a couple of uh, diagrams in your package. Uh, they're the governance model diagrams labeled uh, option 1A and option 1B, and they touch both here in the standing committee discussion as well as in the public advisory committee discussion. Uh, so if you wanted to hold off on, on that uh, until we have uh, both sides of the uh, uh, standing committee and the public advisory committee discussion, that's fine, uh, but I'll describe what I've got for you right now. So. Uh, Currently, um, I believe we are, are running it's the same membership in the Community Development and Environment and Infrastructure Standing Committees to try and uh, achieve the objective of, of, um, of the Mayor's uh, direction coming out of the uh, election. Um, currently, we have four standing committees. You know what they are. Um, we are recommending your consideration to collapse one of the standing committees into another, that would be community development and environment and infrastructure, into one committee that would be some sort of environment services uh, standing committee. Um, and consideration regarding whether you maintain a standalone corporate services standing committee or you transfer its mandate into the overall mandate of the governance and priorities committee. Uh, the rationale is, is stated uh, at the right hand column. Uh, the one uh, collapsing would just uh, uh, house all of the um, uh, standing committee duties in one uh, committee with respect to services provided to the community. And then the recommendation to move corporate services to GBC simply engages all council members in the discussion of corporate uh, matters uh, related to various topics that are within the terms of mandate of the corporate services committee. If uh, council does consider uh, collapsing committees, then you might uh, consider whether you maintain three members of the committee plus the mayor, or whether you move to a more balanced uh, representation, say for instance, uh, four uh, committee members plus the mayor on each of two committees. Uh, those would be the planning and land use standing committee and uh, a standing committee related to services and infrastructure. And the purpose of that is simply to balance the council member participation across two standing committees where we, we currently have more. Four. Uh, we have uh, appointment terms, and we recommend that uh, you consider an 18 month uh, term appointment to a standing committee and that you rotate uh, the members of the standing committees once in a mandate of council so everybody gets an opportunity to serve on the other committee and vice versa. And that's about sharing duties and uh, sharing experience. Uh, we are recommending that a quorum for the committee be three members, so that if there was a committee member absent, the mayor would be required to attend uh, the meeting so that we have a broader representation of the council. I think often councillors feel a bit awkward when there's just two members present at a, a standing committee uh, of, of three people at this point, although it uh, functions just fine. And we do have, uh, we've tried to establish sort of the formality of a relationship between the Standing Committee and the Public Advisory Committee. This is on uh, item six. Um, the intention was that the Standing Committee would sort of have collective ownership over its basket of policy issues 
and have that collective sense of responsibility in the relationship with the public advisory committee. So you might uh, see a, uh, um, attendance of the, of the standing committee members at the public advisory committee meetings uh, from time to time to sort of reinforce that. Um, the, the one issue was the issue that was mentioned early on in the first discussion, which is, uh, does council want a model where there is sort of broad terms of reference for the standing committee and the standing committee members can generate items uh, that are new policies or new uh, proposals and get council's blessing for that and whether the standing committee can uh, refer things that are new to the public advisory committee uh, for advice. So we're, we're simply recommending in six that uh, if the standing committee wants to generate a new policy initiative or a new program initiative, they get council's approval. And then if they want that matter also referred to the public advisory committee, that's part of the referral from council. So those are the, the primary uh, suggestions under the first basket that's called standing committees. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then under seven, in terms of public an, uh, input uh, for the Planning and Land Use Committee, specifically uh, providing a, a regular systematic opportunity for the applicant uh, to speak at the committee uh, or answer questions at the committee so that the committee gets informed uh, related to the applicant's version of events and their perspective in addition to the staff. Okay, process question first. Uh, I, I have a number of questions and comments on each of these. <coughs> so do you want to just do one at a time or do you want to go section by section? Um, I think I'd like to have you group them together because some of them lay off. Okay. Maybe I can just start with the... You just go. Start? I'll start with the last one first because actually the most straightforward. Uh, planning and land use already. Uh, takes the opportunity to ask questions of applicants where the committee members feel that an answer to such a question would be helpful in uh, making a recommendation. And that, I believe, is already part of the mandate of the committee. So I certainly have no objection to entrenching that any further. And I'd look to my planning committee colleagues for their comments on that. So that's an easy one for me. Um, hearkening back to number one, if, you had, if I had had to comment on this three or four months ago, I, uh, and I'm going to speak to the corporate services piece, I probably would have said sure. But I have to say that in the last few months, I've actually thought that the corporate services meetings have been extremely useful and that they've provided an opportunity for clarification and work on uh, different reports and proposals and ideas that have come forward that have then, I think, been refined and been improved before they've gone on to whatever the next step is, um, which I, I'm not sure I would have necessarily thought, you know, last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to support the elimination of corporate services because of its mandate, particularly around finance, but also around a variety of other things, and I'm sure Chris will speak to this as well. So uh, right now, it's, it, I actually think it's providing a very uh, useful function, and I'm always reluctant to tinker with something when it's useful. <laughs> Um, and that being said, I'm not opposed to increasing the numbers in any of the standing committees with, of course, the reservation that if you go to an even number, you're in a position, of course, where you may end up with a recommendation which has no majority. So if, for example, if you go to committees where under a 1A, you go to committees or even under uh, number 2 or number four or four. You go to committees with four plus the mayor. If the mayor's not there, you're going to have four people you could split and then not be able to provide any useful recommendation to GPC or council. So I'm a bit nervous about that, uh, around going to an even number. Um, and I can leave it at that for now. So a couple comments and some questions. Um, it was when Councillor also spoke that, because I, I had the exact opposite opinion about corporate services, but not that it's not useful, it's very useful. And, but it's interesting to hear what, what made me change what I might say uh, is the refinement that happens. But I, I think that uh, before hearing you speak, so I'm, I wanted to hear what others say, I think it's really important to collapse corporate services into GPC because we've got some really hard decisions ahead of us in terms of finances for the next two and a half years. And I think if we've got all brains on deck, um, that would be a really good thing. 
Uh, however, I appreciate that the, the refinement happens and then it comes to us with a little bit more uh, more thought and more work. So jury's out on that. I want to hear what other people say. Um, the is it the two to two? If there's a two to two split, um, what happens? Tie vote fails. So then we would make a recommendation to not go forward or what, whatever. So there, it's not that a decision isn't made. A decision still. So anyways, that's just a, a thought. Um, on number six, the standing committee must obtain council approval to refer a matter to the PAC. Presumably, that excludes planning and land use, referring things to the heritage advisory committee. Is that do we need to make that more clear or because we that would obstruct the process because often staff recommends that we do that which I think is a good thing we shouldn't need to go to GDC to do that your worship um, certainly the terms of reference of the heritage advisory committee and the advisory design panel reference the referrals from the planning and land use committee so from the bottom up their their mandate is the referrals from you um, whether Mr. Woodland will have to comment if this would introduce an inconsistency because it was it, the, the whole process is very much um, allows those referrals. Yeah, well, we could just I, I think some of the referrals are through the land use procedure by the process. Some arise in the recommendation that come from staff, which often go to council to get the thing rolling. Um, some of them are on the fly and come into the planning and land use committee or back to so we'd have to look at that. To okay. see. Yeah, but to clarify, it's you in your um, regulatory approval role making those referrals. Um, going back to the terms of reference, when a uh, zoning regulation bylaw fundamental issue would come before you, that actually goes to Governance and Priorities Committee. And, and you'd may be making referrals if you wanted to um, to the Public Advisory Planning Committee or whatever. on. And, and as you have out of the official committee plan um, on those things which are policy related as opposed to you and your regulatory function. Right. And, and it is an important distinction because in, in performing the functions of the planning and land use standing committee, you're not necessarily changing council's policy mm -hmm. or debating an existing council policy. You're, you're moving something through a series of processes. Uh, that are set by council bylaws and policies. Whereas in the standing committees, you are in fact, in many cases, debating a different policy than we might have already or, or recommending a new policy. Right, so we might change that with the exception of the standing and planning line the standing committee, da, 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 da. does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, just I don't want to obstruct the process of moving things forward. Uh, those are all my questions for now. Jeff? Uh, I, I I think I, I agree with the recommendation of having uh, just two standing committees uh, of four members each plus the mayor. Uh, with regard to corporate services issues, I, I haven't stand on that, I don't think. But um, it seems to me that some, some of the issues will be suitable for a committee that detailed working through a parking fine schedule or, or or detailed application of some tax issue, but and other things should probably go direct to the council. I think I think we could use our judgment there. My instinct is that the division of work would be planning committee and everything else committee. Um, but you know, much, I, I think that would be sort of more or less equal. But I'm not I'm not sure. Um, obviously. The committees either have to have an odd or an even number of members. If it's if it's even, they're in a tie. They have the potential for a tie. If they're odd, and somebody's missing. There's a potential mm -hmm. for a tie. So you you can't get away from that. And that, I think four plus the mayor is a is a reasonable is a reasonable number. With regard to the issue of people referring stuff to the um, public advisory committees, the, the main concern there is financial and impact on staff. And um, I don't mind the standing committees referring issues uh, to a public advisory committee that are for the purpose of the public advisory committee debating. The, the problem we always have is if the public advisory committee 
requires expenditure of staff time. And, that's, and uh, my, my sense is that the standing committees, uh, that the public advisory committees are a little underutilized. And if you can, and I, I know it is a problem uh, getting them used to the idea that uh, there are issues that they should discuss and have a view on, uh, but there, there has to be a pretty tight constraint on their ability to, to request staff reports or other, other things that um, require inputs of dollars. That's, that's the scarce resource. I guess for me, I want to start with a place where the whole goal of what we want to do here is to have more effective uh, Part of that means being more efficient. How can we move things quickly, but still make sure they get adequate oversight? The second piece that I'm holding in my head and maybe uh, somewhat uh, hopeful more than anything else, but to ultimately have everything aligned to deal with how a council does. So we're meeting strategic, strategic priorities. We're going to say, here's the top priorities. Then we start to work out, here's the work plans within that. And we've had stuff within here that says, you know, here's the annual work plans, when we can expect it. We understand when it's going to come to whatever specific committees they have. We can specifically say, and this is where we're going to be working with our land use committee, so they too will be having their work orders. So uh, in a vacuum, a lot of this can be difficult. Um, but in, in, in a system framework, I think it can be efficient. Um, for me, uh, so how can I put it? We're going to have a lot of really big things, as you say, to deal with around um, finance. We, we know that. That's something that council is going to be around. <coughs> Having said that, do I want to spend a lot of time in um, full GPC looking at you know the, the uh, reports that say you know here's the direct awards that we do and everything over this? I mean, there's a whole functioning process that the committee can do that for us as a council as a whole that we want to say to our colleagues on that committee: uh, do the work, make sure you're doing it right, bring it to our attention because we're going to really dig in on land use, or I'm really going to dig in on environment. Because I, and, and you can rely on me to do that work as well. Um, and part of what we've talked about is our responsibility to say, you know what, even though the three of us think this is a good idea, uh, I'm not sure our, we're going to get past four at council. Let's get it to GPC or let's bring it up. Uh, and I think land use has done something in the last month or two that has been unique thinking, and thank you for that, uh, which is uh, land use has said, well, this is something that we know council is going to want to look at. Before we used to send it to council, we'd then send it back to GPC, mm -hmm. who then might change the mind and send it back to council to move on to public hearing. What land use has done is they said, well, wait a minute. Uh, uh, why don't we have that full presentation at council? So even though there might be a recommendation to decline, let us have that full presentation at council. So council may say, wait a minute, as a whole, we actually want to send this to public hearing, or reverse, we don't want to. So it really cut it out, and so it dealt with that issue of uh, being effective, as in giving it full consideration, making sure all the information is there, but at the same time, being efficient. It got to council quickly, council in full consideration moved it forward. Um, so so I, I, I'm kind of a little bit reluctant to get rid of corporate services, knowing that there's a lot of things that just need to be done uh, on a one down level. The same corporate services needs to have that responsibility to say, you know what, this one we know, we got to kick naming rights to GBC. That's not something we're going to decide short council and it's going to be rubber stamp. It's going to be a big one. So uh, that that's part of our effectiveness as a council. Um, we didn't have a lot of work, and I don't know whether it's because we wanted to move quickly on some things, or we all sort of assumed that housing was a good priority and let's move, and harm reduction is a good priority and let's move. And, and so we didn't kick a lot of that stuff to community development. And you know, we all thought a climate change strategy is good, so you know, we, we created a department of sustainability. So we didn't kick a lot of stuff to the environment committee. Uh, so, um, you know, that was why my recommendation I said, okay, you know what, community development, so let's pull that a little bit tighter. Let's make sure that their work is effective. But I think very much what I heard, uh, and I heard many things, and I gave you a copy of the results, uh, or what you want to say is they want to and, and can provide um, a lot of work uh, giving us feedback, giving that community information. Perhaps, as we talked about, is do we want to restrict the only comments to the nine members of that committee? Or maybe that committee's job is now is how do we make sure that we have full consultation on you know, uh, whatever issue we think is a, a product and all. So 
So I sort of had that overarching, how are, what are we doing to make things move forward? And, and I actually think that we have got in, gotten quicker to yes or no on land use uh, quicker um, than, than we did in the old system. We were thinking the GPC and all weighted in. And, and so um, uh, I, I would like to keep that. And, and again, that's you know, the old joke about committees is where good ideas go and get better and when bad ideas go to die. But sometimes committees are also a, a way to put off a decision or to frankly to bury a decision through delay, making sure it never comes up or back, right? So um, it's, and that's not good effective governance either. So our, our goal, my goal is what system are we setting up that allows council's priorities to work effectively, moving things forward, um, but making sure at the appropriate level all of council is weighing in. Now, assuming if it's tied to the priorities, council has weighed in and collectively has said, these are our priorities. Now, committee, go do your work. Um, and same thing with the advisory committees that are tied. So, I know there's people newer to this, but having seen some of the work that's come out of corporate services, um, I haven't seen, and I must admit, I haven't been following any other committees. Uh, any other committees met? Yeah. Okay, and... and what are we we had one, one. that's you, that's three. Oh, we had the yeah. conference, yeah, when there was two of them. So all, all I'm going to say is, uh, uh, my thought is, before we totally give up and just go to two committees, uh, I think it would be of value to uh, look at having community development, environment, and infrastructure come together to keep corporate services, uh, keep with three people per committee, uh, but make sure that the the council's work on priorities is then tied to the committee's work, and that committee's work is then tied to the advisory body's work. So the advisory body also know, you know, like when the parks management plan is coming to them uh, for, for input. And if we do that, then I think we have a really effective and functioning team that the committee members, and, uh, our advisory committee members, will feel like they're being valued and their input is there, and they can clearly see. Uh, where their input is, is being asked and clearly see where their input is being followed or ignored. <laughs> uh, but at least they have that clarity. So, I don't know, I, I don't, I, I, we come, two just feels so cumbersome. And if you have four plus the mayor, that's five. Isn't that really council as a whole come in? And if all five of you pass it, then why are you bothering go to GPC? Because, you know, I, I just, Mr. Woodland. Uh, now that have muddied the waters. Uh. No, no, I'm just a uh, technical point. Uh, you're, uh, you're ex officio member. You're always welcome, but you don't often attend. So we would expect that you would probably stick to that type of routine. The four regular members are always there. You would attend when one of them can't go. Uh, currently, there's three regular members plus yourself. Often you will go when one of them can't go. So that's what we read into that particular because we do want to respect that issue, which is don't create a mini uh, quorum or a mini uh, majority on a matter that just gets rubber stamped. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, but the number of people on and then we have uh, just wanted to speak to, uh, just specifically to corporate services and whether or not it should have the mandate uh, transferred to GPC. And I would speak in support of Lisa's comments. Um, it's been an interesting situation to observe that, um, I'm trying to choose the right words to describe it, but it just seems to me, that as Lisa had said, these are such important issues that we all need to have the same level, I think, of understanding and input in terms of what comes under the umbrella of corporate services. And it just seemed to me that when recommendations came forward, um, not to criticize the good work that was done, but the work was so done and it was so basically cooked or baked that coming to council or committee almost seemed like a formality rather than this is where there's going to be some serious work done as well. And I'm hoping that's not just a perception I have, but that's how I felt mm -hmm. throughout. And I, I just feel with the, those kinds of issues that I think we need to be there in the basement, on the ground, at the beginning of those discussions. And that's why I'm in favor of it moving to, um, to GPC. 
I just think they are so important. And for whatever reason, they just, you know, it seemed like they had, uh, they really had legs by the time they got to our table. And it was like, well, don't really need to be here. It's moving through. And I just, I think that the fundamentals are so important and those, the decisions and the subject areas that we deal with are so far reaching that I think it's an area where I think we each need to take on the same amount of responsibility and be able to hear all of it around our table. Now, whether or not you want to divide it up in a way where there's more routine things that would go to a corporate services committee, but they're really substantive issues that I think Lisa might have been uh, acknowledging. Would, uh, would would come to council and how that determination would be made. If that's not an option, I think my position would be to um, to have it come to GPC because we're going to be dealing with these one after another after another for the rest of our term, and everyone's going to be a building block, hopefully, on the next decision that we have to make. And I, I just think we need to shoulder it as a council. And it may take a little bit more time, but I sometimes think you know sometimes things that are baked a bit longer are better too. So I'm prepared to to get more time if that's what it takes, but I really think there's a value in that. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, then Shelley, then Chris. Thank you. I have a question for the Corporate Services Committee and maybe Mr. Woodland. Is there a way, because I'm you know, working on my perpetual amendments here, something like eliminate the financial planning aspects of corporate services and transfer this part of its mandate to GPC? Is it easily dividable like that? Like big picture, like is there a way to say this is an obvious thing that goes directly to GPC? And this can stay at corporate services or to Jeff's thing, the everything else committee. Through your worship, I think that would be quite subjective. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if you'd want to put the administration to sort of look at this and mm -hmm. parcel stuff to different places. Um, at least in the last little while, the vast majority of things that have been at corporate services are fairly needy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But can I speak to that? Because you're, you're right. But corporate services doesn't have the capacity to approve anything other than the most routine things. Like this morning, we received a report about single payers or signatures, right? Anything that has any substance always goes to GPC because the committee itself doesn't have the capacity to say yes. So it already has a safeguard built in. I mean, it's, its utility, I think, is the ability to have a first conversation, usually with staff, to say, this is completely off the wall, and what have we missed? Um, it doesn't have the ability to say yes. It has to go to corporate, to, to uh, GPC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, reflecting on Councilor Madoff's comments about where the, where, the, where the right starting point is for substantive issues. But on the flip side, by the time something goes through planning and land use, and the time it comes to, to GPC, or yes, to Council, by the time it comes to Council, it's, unless there's something massive, it's, you know, we've, planning staff has done the work, we've done the work, and then, it, it's, I mean, I haven't been here that long, but it seems to me that the same thing happens when something comes forward from Planning and Land Use Standing Committee, that it's kind of almost a done deal. Um, not, not a done deal, no. but a done deal in terms of, yes, we're sending this to public hearing. Okay. Well, and I think that's the difference because there's a significant role for council right. and in a public venue as well, and that's mm -hmm. that doesn't exist in this model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But there's more steps, I guess, is what I meant. Mm -hmm. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, that, thank you. That's helpful. That's totally helpful. Is Shelley Chris. I'm done. Well, just reflecting on this morning's meeting, I'm a, a mixed emote and mixed thoughts, but I, I actually would support, I think I'm going in favor of this, just because the more voices at the table, the more wholesome the discussion, especially with what some of the things we were talking about today. You know, yes, we're flushing out stuff, but we probably spent a half an hour flushing out stuff, and the other time was brainstorming. And the more voices at the table to brainstorm, the more different opinions, the better. Perhaps. I, I um, agree. We spent an hour and a half brainstorming. I was giving direction that we were already mm -hmm. planning to send this to a GPC for the discussion. I think that, in fact, we've always held, and, and Jeff said that he did, hasn't sat on corporate services, but you used to chair it in its earlier iteration as finance so and HR. Uh, so that was, because that's the role that's taken over. Um, I think that we've always taken that role and said you have a lot of work to do leading up to the budget process, and then it sort of goes into abeyance for six months. Yeah. There are some things that come. I actually think that we should be stabilizing this and meeting 
monthly on a range of different issues because it has the HR function, it has a number of other things that are critically important. It's odd to me, though, that we've never given uh, the old finance and HR or now corporate services a public advisory committee to reflect through. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has been uh, something that we, is a deficiency that we should be doing. It's how you then populate that table that becomes critically important. I think uh, losing it would be a mistake because we spent an hour and a half brainstorming with three of us, mm -hmm. recognize you run into the same time frame issue. And one of the advantages we did have with uh, Peter's earlier presentation to us, and we said this is weighty stuff on the tax ratio, tax rate issue, it should go to GPC. But in the discussion, we also said, in fact, we should be doing a special public meeting mm -hmm. with the Chamber of Commerce, with business representatives, with community neighborhood representatives, and we got about 30 people. It's the first time a number of people commented. It was the first time for most of us that we'd seen more than two people here on financial, members of the public, on financial discussion. So I, I think that it actually is a good clearinghouse for other conversations. I just don't think we invest enough time or resources to draw out the different voices necessary. Through your worship, I, I guess I, and I'm not disagreeing with any of the comments around the table. My only concern would would be staff capacity. Mm -hmm. The more you create, you know, mm -hmm. we're already kind of stretched to the limit. So that would be just my caution. Yeah, I like the simplicity of what staff are recommending, and uh, I guess the element of fairness that over the life of a council, everyone would basically have an oversight role over all of the city's operations. Um, and I guess for that reason, uh, I think we could, it should be pursued. Um, I guess my final reflection is that um, part of what we looked at earlier is, is not everybody speaking on every subject uh, and like the meetings and, and what we're now creating is everything will now come to generally to GPC where we'll all speak lightly on every subject and we might want to consider going to every week uh, if we're going to basically do all of that. Um, so I think that's the first one. Um, and part of it is almost going back to where we were before um, and, and we probably should have a bit of reflection of why we changed from the old system. Uh, what are we trying to fix that's broken here? I certainly understand that some people feel that, you know, something's coming forward that has already been chewed up and, and gone on. And I've heard complaints that Times calling his phones people on Monday and the comments is on Tuesday before it gets to the committee on Wednesday. And it's all done and, and, and dealt with ahead of time. And ultimately, council, our job, and we've done it fairly well, is to say, if there's a contentious issue coming up here. As a councillor, you may be interested in going sitting down and getting that information. So it doesn't preclude you from getting the information and digging in. Um, but I don't want to throw out the uh, baby with the, the bathwater, which is to say, have we become a more effective and efficient council? So my fear is put it all in. I mean, really, we might as well start. We should probably bring uh, land use back into GPC too. Uh, so, and, and then we're right back to what we did is before is we did GPC every Thursday, and it was from basically it was nine in the morning to whenever, whenever the agenda or individuals were exhausted. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so all I'm saying is think this through before we, uh, because I don't think there, the simplicity piece is actually isn't. It all gets piled up and, and there hasn't been that first cut at culling some of the stuff that isn't important out or meaning and ease in decisions that then allow us to, to uh, uh, focus more on, on what the, the bigger decisions are. But I guess it's a part of practice. I'm out of list. Charlie? <coughs> I think um, these ideas did come forward because we we're trying to I guess that would have simplifies the word, but make more use of our time. But it also goes back to our own self-responsibility that if there's issues, so for example, when the planning land use um, agenda comes out, I think of since, since the new council, I think I missed two, and I think it was because I looked at the agenda and there weren't any substantial things that I thought I need to be totally up to speed on. But it, it takes each councillor to say, you know, there's a topic that I think I need to either know more about, or if the motion recommendation is to decline, I want to be able to understand why and to hear the committee's comments 
so that when it comes to council, um, either I can ask the question, like, I missed that meeting, can you explain why it was declined, or, or something. It, it puts the onus back on us to do some legwork. But I do think um, for the community development and, and environment and infrastructure, there have been some discussions that I think was fine to have it just at the committee and to go to council for just uh, for approval. But there have been others that we said, you know, this is a meteor, you know, like the Beacon Hill Management Plan, Transportation Plan, that this definitely has to go to have a larger discussion with our uh, governance and priorities. And I think it's the committee and the chair, it puts the onus on the committee and the chair to recognize that and to steer it to the right committee. Also, when it comes to council and the minutes, that there's no saying that we have to vote against or, or support it. We can say, I'm not comfortable at this time with it. I need more information. Can we send it back to GPC uh, for more thorough presentation? That means that certain ones do get screened a little bit more, but not every single item that goes across the committee's table needs to be screened. And so I would be, you know, I'm definitely supportive of what I've seen come to as the chair of community development and environment and infrastructure. Uh, I feel comfortable of, uh, putting it to one. I think we can deal with the items um, in one meeting. The corporate services, um, I, I feel comfortable that um, there's some thing work that can be done there uh, that can come to the rest of the committee after. And, and if I am not comfortable, then I'll say to the committee members, you know, can we consider it coming to GPC or, um, or ask the question. It just puts the onus back on us as counselors to ask the questions that we need to ask. And, but I don't think that if we if we are having everything coming back to uh, GPC, we are going back to the old ways of the committee of the whole, which we we're trying to get out of. Like I think planning and land use has, you know, having been at the planning and land use, and I mean, I mean, G, um, was it uh, committee of the whole when we discussed it, and then being in the planning and land use committee, and now just being not on the committee, but sitting as a council member at the back, I do think that the, it has improved. It's been effective, it's improved. I think, uh, I think it's worked a little bit better for the development community. I think if there are concerns, it does go to GPC or we ask the questions. And, and I think it, it also has shown the staff, the, the reports that we've been getting are a lot more thorough and, and answer the questions that I need answered. So definitely planning land use, I think that should stay. Um, I have no problem with corporate services um, um, staying as a committee, and if there's some items that are concerned that they do go to GPC. So I can support that. Pam, show. Thank you. Um, again, just going back to, um, and maybe trying to think about another solution, if you know, economic development has been identified as council's number one priority. And I have to admit, I wish it had been characterized in a different way because I think economic development should overarch everything. And instead, what I tend to see is that that's what's, you know, that's the locomotive leading the train rather than being the source of power for the whole, you know, the, the, the entire railway in that way. But it, because that amount of prominence has been put on it, and those very significant financial issues go to corporate services first, that's where I'm really having a problem. And so maybe it's looking at um, the issues that have to do with, with budget and revenue creation and all of that kind of thing, rather than it going to corporate services, that it would come to GPC. You know, because that's where I feel that we're missing that step, in the, that step in the process. And there's so many different aspects of it. And I, ju I think it is really important that, that we can have that level of involvement. Mechanically, there's a lot of different ways it could be done. It could be done in terms of the nature of the um, proposal and whether it goes to um, corporate services or whether it goes to GPC. Or, you know, as uh, Chris was sort of alluding to, when there used to be the finance and HR component of it, and is it a different um, makeup in terms of the participants in that committee? I mean, if economic development is our number one priority, maybe we should be having an actual council that deals with that as a committee in, in, in that sense so that we're all there early on. So it's not adding on to the GPC agenda. It's, it's a, yes, it's another meeting, but it's still dealing with those same issues. I'm just trying to find a mechanism where with those issues that could not be of greater importance right now. 
I mean, in terms of, of the economy and the finances and everything else, we've never been in a situation like we are here, along with everybody else around the globe. You know, misery likes company. It's not just Victoria. <laughs> but it, it is so important that I just feel that we need to be there right from the beginning, charting the course of how we're going to deal with those kinds of, of issues related to budget, revenue, and all of those kinds of things. So I'm not... Um, identifying a particular model and saying it should be going all to GPC or it should be an actual standing committee of, of uh, council, but I just think there needs to be another step when we're dealing with those really significant issues. So I could welcome any other suggestions, but the mechanism isn't what concerns me, it's the outcome. And I certainly understand you know, speed and efficiency, but I'm, my main interest, and I'm sure it is for everyone, you know, is faster is great if it means better. But if it doesn't, then I'm, I'm willing to say, well, okay, is there more work I need to do? And I'm prepared to give it more time if that's mm -hmm. what's going to bring us all to a better result as well. So I'd really appreciate some consideration of perhaps it's a different mechanism and it's not rolling it into GPC perhaps, but it's something else where we can roll our sleeves up and work on those really significant financial issues without feeling the constraints of the clock ticking at a GPC perhaps. Nice suggestion on that one. Shelley, is it? Um, I agree with Pam. On, uh, uh, it, it's, inter it's an interesting discussion because I, I like what's here. I mm -hmm. like the simplifying it. Um, but I'm okay with another meeting, uh, an extra meeting a week every other week. You know what? Uh, that's because we end up meeting anyhow if you're on the committee. So it's kind of not, a, it's not like double. You're not doubling the workload. You're just adding more bodies. It's, yeah, yeah, kind of. Yes. Pretty much. It's the same amount of more work, just adding more bodies. Exactly. So. Um, I have a proposed way forward. Well, first of all, oh, hey. well, <laughs> but I'm getting. I got one too, so don't, don't make yeah. a motion. No, I'm not going to make a motion. No, I'm, I don't feel like it's motion time. But first of all, I just want to respond to one of the things that Councillor Maddow said. In terms of economic development, in my opinion, it's the Planning and Land Use Standing Committee that is the engine of economic development. Because we are the ones that are approving or disapproving development, which is the key source of revenue for the city. So I just want to say that we're like that's a really important aspect of economic development. And, you know, maybe the planning and development should, department should be called the planning and economic development department. But I'll, you know, leave that aside for now. But one of the things that, um, that the mayor said, it w uh, one of the ways that we found our way forward with planning and land use to move things forward and not have them be cumbersome, uh, as in refer to GPC, is we said, okay, we'll move this forward to, for council to recommend to a public hearing, but with a full presentation to council. So what if we did the same thing for corporate services? And I know what happens in a kind of, we'll, we'll approve the report, but what if it goes to council for approval and then with a flag to say, hey, at this council meeting, and maybe it means we start that council meeting a little bit early if we're going to need more time, at that council meeting, we have a more fulsome discussion, kind of the way that we did with the budget, but it was late and we were tired and I don't think that we, it, it hasn't been built into the process. So does that make sense as a suggestion? It does, but, but let me add to that. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing we also need to recognize is that in the old system, when we worked it all out at GPC, then there was a certain perception that we were rubber stamping at council. Yeah. Yeah. Now at GPC, there's no public input. And yet when you, people keep saying, well, we need a town hall meeting. Well, I hate to tell you this, but we have a town hall meeting every second Thursday, right? Uh, we have, we have a list, we have agenda, we tell people, people come in and tell us what we're talking about. It's not just land use issues, it's about stuff that's coming up in committees. People can have delegations, you can come and do question periods. So there's an opportunity, I think, that I mean, is, is to recognize that maybe council becomes more reflective of our civic engagement policy, which is we're actually interested in hearing from the public at that time. So sure, committee may send it up, uh, you know, like the, the standing committee send it up, but you know, council, we cannot be afraid to say, we're going to talk about this, we're going to hear from people, we're going to have our discussions at that meeting. Mm -hmm. It might be to send it back. Um, I mean, so I, so I just want to have that reflection, that when, you, we, we, when we started to do everything at GPC, it was rubber stamp, because we, we talked it all out. The voting's already been done, uh, you know, and, and so we didn't have that. So think about that thing. Now, when it comes to something like, for example, if we want to, um, economic development, or if it comes to, which I think is what we're really going to have to sit down and dig in on uh, around our finance and stuff, is I think that we are, over the next four or five months, going to have to sit as a council with our staff. It'll come out of our strategic planning. But we're going to have to sit down and start saying, okay, let's start figuring out what are we into, what are we out of, where are we going to go, what are, you know, and, 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 and so 
we are going to have, for lack of a better term, special means of counsel to deal with that. Because it is at a priority level that we are, and we're not going to clutter it up with anything else on the agenda that day. Uh, we're just going to start working on it and setting, and we'll see where we get to. So I, I guess for me, um, I, I just want to put those out, that there's a chance. So on those really big ones, uh, and secondly, I think part of the angst that's coming here is it's just a little bit into that. I can bring something forward to my standing committee meeting, whereas once we have our priorities set, then the standing committees are doing the work of council. Council has decided all of those items, to sort of extent what we're working on. It doesn't close it. The things that come forward, but if somebody says, I want to bring a new motion about um, renting ducks, um, <laughs> that, that we can say, thank you very much. Priority session is there, or it goes to this thing. We, we can, we can, we can, there, so there's room to bring new stuff up, but it's still not a way to can, can have it all packaged to go. So, anyways, that's just my thought. That uh, I like the system that we can actually use council as a, as a town hall meeting that people come in and talk. We have that system set up, um, and, and as long as we make sure that our groups, our, our standing committees, whatever number we have, are working on our priorities and recognizing that those things that are our top priorities we have special meetings of council. We have to, that's our next six months, guys. Sitting down going, what businesses are we in? Which ones do we want to look at? How do we generate more revenue? What ideas do we want to look at? And then we, we give our instructions to staff. Please go give us a report on, you know, uh, what was your, please go give us a report on Sunday parking. Sorry, that was, parking. Oh, I'm trying to remember the, the, the idea that came up. Sorry, don't introduce Sunday parking. <laughs> Um, so, uh, can somebody bundle this up for us? Okay, let me put on the table then, just for uh, my, um, for my, uh, I'll put on the table to make it happen. But we look to collapse community development and environment infrastructure into one committee. Uh, that we keep corporate service committee. Um, that can you we do them one at a time? If that's going to be one motion, that's okay. Okay. Okay, then uh, the first one I'll put on the table is that we keep the Corporate Services Committee. All those, uh, mm -hmm. all those in favor? Service. Corporate Services stays as a standing committee. Oh, I thought you were skipping the first one. Yeah, I wonder what What's you didn't do it in one. Yeah, uh, oh, how yeah. I vote on the first one is going to depend on what happens on the, on the second one. If, if you collapse that one, I'm voting for class and all into GPC. We might as well just do our work there, get her done. And, uh, it doesn't make any sense to... Uh, my, my first motion is to keep corporate service as a, services as a standing committee. Okay. All those. Uh, in. What, what is the alternate motion would be uh, going? No, I, I, I don't know whether, whether Pam was. Are you? Uh, is Pam planning to put the alternate motion on the floor if this fails? Well, it seems like we're going in a sort of an all or nothing uh, direction here, which concerns me. Well, no, yes. I, I, so it sort of makes me already not want to participate in this vote because of the way it's being um, characterized and structured. So I felt that there was move, I thought that there was another option that we might wish to consider, but apparently not. Yeah, and the option is, is to have a, on, on that we will have, the council will have special meetings regarding um, you know, the, the budget finances. Uh, corporate services, I mean, that's those big picture ones. But then we'll have a standing committee of three people who will be taking the direction from that larger council motion to do some of the work done. I guess my concern is the way that you characterized it is that if one is not supportive of corporate services being restructured, that means everything goes back to ground zero and everything goes to GPC. And I really think that's doing a discredit to the comments that have been made. I'm sorry. Okay. Someone asked me why I was bringing corporate services mm -hmm. The reason why I actually put that on the table first is because how I, as an individual, vote on the second one will be determined about the first one goes. Uh, I, I, Even though that is not a motion that they would all go back to GPC. No, 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 no. no, no. But that certainly has an effect on that conversation. So the motion is to keep corporate services. Mr. Whitman? <laughs> you don't need a motion to keep the status quo. Can I, can I is that right? So, uh, if you make no motion on the Corporate Services Committee, it continues to exist. Very good point. The status quo would remain in place. So, we have to, yeah. 
have to address at some point. So if someone is going to put the other motion on the table, then just have it out. I'm comfortable keeping it or not, so I thought it actually be useful to say we intend to keep it. So whether it's actually a formal motion to keep something that exists or an intention, state is intention. Can I just ask a question of clarification? Doesn't voting, I'm looking at this as a whole. Like, in, to me, it makes sense what the staff, the recommendations have come up with as a whole. You have two committees, you have four people on each, you have a, you know, the mayor is the, to start defeating one piece at a time defeats, it seems to screw everything that's been done. It, like, generally. Do you know what, because it makes, it, it seems fair the way it's presented as it is that I look at it rather than going piece by piece, I'm going, okay, there's two standing committees, there's four people on each, there's eight council, you know, we split it up, we switch after 18 months. And to start, okay, now we're going to add another committee, we're, it'll change everything on this page, I think, if we start breaking it off piece by piece, even though I know we agreed to that at the beginning, I'm kind of looking at it now going, well, holy smokes, that kind of... So for me, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to put it, staff have put provide some recommendations. I was actually going to put a motion on that I thought captured what the majority of council wanted, and then we'll see if that happened or not. But I've been asked to essentially sever each item and deal with it individually. So we're now falling into rules of order. If someone asks us to sever individually, I think we're required by procedure to sever each one individually. Mr. Woodland. Uh, just a couple uh, points uh, of information. Um, governance and Priorities Committee currently has within its terms of reference the five-year financial plan, which would include the capital plan and taxation policy. So that is not uh, being wrested away from that particular body. And um, uh, the other piece of information is whatever number of committees you choose, uh, then reflect on the right number of members to be on those mm -hmm. committees to try and balance it. So as long as you apply the same kind of logic, if you've got more, probably fewer members. If you've got fewer, probably more members. That's all we were trying to get at with our suggestions. I just, I think if somebody, if someone, if, if we're going to deal with corporate services, then whoever is in favor of this, eliminate corporate services and transfer its mandate to GPC. If someone could make that motion, that would be great. Then we can move forward. Okay, I'll make I'm, you no, I'm not. I'm not making that motion because I'm not in support of it. <laughs> okay, the motion is on the table to eliminate corporate services and transfers mandates to GPC. Yes. Uh, let's move an amendment that we eliminate the corporate services standing committee and divide its mandate between the non-plus standing committee and GPC. Uh, whatever the new committee is called, the not planning committee. committee B. B. The one we, the recommendation We don't know what it's going to be called. The, committee, the ICE committee. committee, Infrastructure, Community, and Environment. Oh, oh. <laughs> so say it again. Yeah, say it again. It, it's what Councillor Madoff had articulated. Eliminate Corporate Services Committee and redistribute its mandate between the non-planning standing committee and GPC. Because some issues could be flushed out in that standing committee. Others are more properly dealt with. So, send corporate services to community development environment Some of it to mandate. Some to planning. And, and some to planning. planning. No, no, and no, some to none GPC. To none to planning and land use. Because we have very little work. Uh, all in favor of okay, all in favor of the main motion? The main motion. Main motion is to eliminate corporate services and transfers and oh. mandates. To go on those. To the Four. Uh, okay, motion fails. Motion, so ultimately what it means is we keep corporate services. Okay. The next one is collapse community development and environment and infrastructure into one. Somebody okay. has to trip there. Someone. Moved. Somebody. What are you saying, Jeff? Yeah. Well, yeah, I know, I, yeah, I was still thinking. I was still yeah. thinking. Somebody, somebody voted to amend a motion and then voted against the motion. Yeah. Yeah, that was me because I was yeah. so. Oh, I, I voted to amend the motion. What do you think? That didn't seem right, though. On it. We could re bring this up at any future meeting, too. If, especially someone who was recorded in the negative on that. But it's important to continue. Do it now. To further I think it's important. So that, I guess the option would be a substitute motion, or if someone felt that they wanted to be recorded in the affirmative, then it would change the outcome of that vote. See, it would have been good to have. It. 
an affirmative motion to keep the corporate standing committee. Ah, okay, so corporate standing committee remains. There is a motion by Charmaine Thornton Joe to collapse the community development and environment and infrastructure committee into one committee. All those in favor? Okay, so that leaves us with three committees, three standing committees. Corporate, the environment, everybody, the land use. Okay. Can I say that we continue to have three members on each committee, plus the mayor as, um, as a ad hoc committee member? Uh, discussion on, I mean, Shelly, I, I see you're not. Well, because I like the idea of form one. I think you're getting a more fulsome discussion. You're getting more, you're, it, I, I think it's good to have more voices at the table, and I think it's good to simplify it. I think what the staff is recommending are good recommendations, um, generally. And I, 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 I think it defeats, it, it ultimately defeats it to go to three. So we have three committees. We're now talking about the member, how many people are on each committee. Can I have a motion from someone to put membership number of members on the committee? So it's three, three, and three? So it would be three, three, and three. Oh, okay. Plus the mayor. Because the mayor is the that means somebody is on the Three, three, and three plus right. that. Okay, we're going to stick with the status quo. Cool. So, but it doesn't work if there's, you need nine people and you've got eight because you're X on all of them, right? No, somebody sits on two committees. What do you mean? Well, I think they should, I think they should be more than three. I, I don't think it's adequate. I would move to have four to um, item recommendation uh, 1A, uh, increase each yeah. standing committee membership to four members plus the mayor. Okay, all those in favor of 1A. 1A. Excellent. Okay, four people in each committee. Um, the quorum currently is two members. Uh, so, do you wish member to do you wish status number four? We didn't. Four. Two? We didn't do two. two. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Eighteen months. Eighteen All of two is moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. So we rotate every 18 months. Okay. Uh, quorum is currently two members. The suggestion is quorum is three members, one of whom may be the mayor if someone is absent. Yeah, I'll move that. I think you have to have three if you're going to have four members. Yes. Okay. All those in favor? I think mathematically we may have gotten into a problem with this motion with two. Like, Councillor Alto serves on two. A lot of people will be serving on two. But it says you serve only one term. So we're not going to be able to fill committees in, in 11 months. Yeah. 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 Before the rotation to a new state. It doesn't say, you can't, it doesn't say you can't serve on more than one committee. It just says yeah. you sit on a committee and you move. Yes, but we won't be able to fill it because there's going to be two of us are going to be appointed to serve on second committees. And it would mean we couldn't serve on the two we're already on. No, that doesn't say that. It says serve one you have term to serve on one term before you can rotate to a new one. It doesn't say you have to be rotated to a new one. I, I can sit I on corporate services have a and point planning. If we, if we put on the table three little sets of four cups and then have a few <laughs> <marbles>, <laughs> and we try and do that, I think we may find these right, but I'm not sure. Different to the next year. You can sit on the first committee, right. right? And stay on one that you're on. I mean, I, I, oh. I could be on two committees right now, and in 18 months from now, I can, as chair of planning, I could still be on planning and not be chair. And Except then that go says and then. serve one term on yeah, that. Okay, so we use the rotation here, but fundamentally, I think that. Go ahead. If four people yeah, only serve yeah. on one committee, yes. and they're all on that committee, and everybody on that and committee, all those four will all serve yeah. on both other two committees. Okay, but then after that first rotation, then they're going to be stale. Mr. Whittle, well, I've got a new council. Yeah, you may. Our mathematician. Oh. <laughs> well, no, I don't. There may be something here, but the, the point was to rotate everyone so they're not on the same committee for the entire term, that they have shared uh, opportunities at the different committees. So the intention was if you're, if you're on this committee, you do move to the next committee. Uh, but you only rotate once. So it might work, actually, so in the life of a council. Years. So then there would have to be a reset button when an election takes place. <laughs> yeah, but we there is. Well, except councillors, right. six councillors are still here. There will be hiccups in terms of 
the current term because we've got two and a half years left. So we'll we'll work on that. Yeah. We'll try to interpret this principle if that's what council sure. wishes. And, and that's a good fundamental question. Um, but ultimately, yeah, after an election, everything old is new again. Sure. So because otherwise, by the third term, you can't sit on any committee. Well, you can come back after a, big, a time ago. But if for this to work, you will have to be able to serve once the election we will accomplish that. We get everybody on each committee. Charlene? And I'm fine with that. Folks, can I have the attention of the table, please? <laughs> Charlene? Charlene has the floor, please. I, I'm fine with that. My only concern is ensuring that there is, not all, everybody on the whole committee changes. I think there's the importance of one person at least a minimum of one person staying on the committee mm -hmm. and a new person be added. So for example, planning and land use, to have a whole planning mm -hmm. and land use be a whole new committee mm -hmm. without knowing the procedure mm -hmm. and, because it's very, it's got its own set of sort of intricacies and I think it'd be difficult for staff, it'd be difficult for the public and also for the, the city <coughs> committee. So as long as whatever we're doing, there is some ability that's some people or one person stays and the rest move and so there's still in every committee some consistency mm -hmm. of somebody with experience on that committee. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my only concern. We, we were just about to class everything back into GPC. I, I, I feel strongly that we all have experience. We all know the decision. We, we may not know the planning and land use thing, but we've got Mr. Woodland sitting right behind us saying, okay, now is the time to do this in terms of the procedure. So. I think we have to have confidence in our own capacity. We we just wanted to hand everything to all of ourselves, so why can't we just be dispersed in little pods of four working stuff out? Mm -hmm. And understand more. Yeah, yeah exactly. The evil that's trying to be corrected is that uh, one or two counselors don't become, quote, you know, the, the go-to counselor. The go-to counselor, and you know, it's about making sure that council makes the decision, so that's ultimately is, is, was the reason. Is that is, it's not about having experience there so much as because theoretically we've all been elected and more about having the, the, the person this in some ways and you get to dig in at council anyways even if you're not on that committee when you get to dig in on council when it comes as a committee report yeah councillor Aldo. well I, I agree with that but i think it's important to to reiterate what charlene has said pam has been on planning for a long time and there is enormous value in that because of the history and the understanding of the evolution of the planning process. And last term, for the year that I was here, I was on planning with Pam and a former counselor. Now in the new term, Pam and I are still on planning, but now Lisa's at the table bringing a new voice and a new perspective. So now you have a situation where you have extraordinary experience, a little bit of experience, and a totally new perspective. There's value in all of those things. And so I think it's important when this, when this is applied that we remember the goals that everyone has has related in the sense of making sure that there's a totality in it, accessing our experience and relying on our collective ability to make good decisions, but also recognizing the utility of having continuity. So those two things have to be balanced out, I think. And that's the challenge that is before us, but I think it's possible for us to execute. Okay, shall we? And then we'll try to try well, to I think it adds to <laughs> but, but I think it adds to the, what we were talking about earlier on the governance model. It will build us working together more. If everyone's gone and four of us are starting new, mm -hmm. it'll be, hey, Pam, <laughs> Marianne, people, like I think that might actually build, or, or Pam can come up to me and go, Shelly, you gotta understand what's happened, and it'll build that working together model of the council, not team building, but saying, hey, I'm going to have to go talk to Shelley because I'm no longer there. And it does address the real issue of having people be on things too long. You right? better be silent on that issue. Um, well, I don't think we're going to agree on having everybody serve one term and rotating, so I think we should leave that oh. alone. I don't even think it's mathematically possible, but yeah, so we've obviously had we'll our work against the law. <laughs> Don't. We'll, we'll come back on that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so we did four. Thank you. Um, six. 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 Uh,
Uh, you must obtain council approval to refer a matter to the PAC. Good exception. Good exception. Yeah. The exception plan language. Yes. We have to that are aligned to policy community development environment options. We did collapse money. Uh, C1B. So your worship, um, I would just comment that um, there should be a relationship between a PAC and standing committee. So if you collapsed two, you might consider collapsing two advisory committees together. If you create a new one, you might consider adding it. So that's, that's it. So I'm sorry. So there, there's two fundamental, so I mean, the fundamental question that staff is putting forth this, and I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do it in the right way. I think I got it here. But we either, okay, so staff has some, some interesting ideas, but we either maintain our public advisory Communities having three each sort of uh, attached to well we have two obviously we have two well, corporate services we we'll have community development infrastructure nobody else uh, and then we have heritage and design panel that sort of support um, the land use one right so we have those part of, so we can retain those and or uh, part of what they say is do we want to look to say um, having Instead of doing the advisory committees that sit there, do we convene mandate-specific, time-limited, for lack of a better term, task force? Rather than having a committee that deals with it and say, okay, you're the task force that comes together and you're going to provide us advice on our priorities. Our priorities. I'll do that. You still got to keep design panel and heritage. Yeah, okay. yeah, the but those are statutorily yeah. mandated. Okay, yeah. good. And no, that was my question. And that the goal is to say, and within the people that apply, to say, and, and then some may have to be technical in nature, uh, and, and that's one issue. And then there's others that are more of um, community in, in, in nature, which is to say, you know, please give us advice on the BT. You know, we, we might, I'm just trying to be clear. We're going to bring a whole five, ten people together who are going to provide us advice on the Beacondale management, transportation management stuff, because we're going to do that, or how we're going to get through, if we choose to do it, the Chandler, Godzilla. I think it should be more high level than that. I'm with you. It needs to, I'm trying to think, I couldn't think of a good example right now, yeah. but there we go. Economic development. Uh, who that? Um, I, I can agree with that. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, I've seen an attempt to do this in the past, the, the out is normally that these task forces simply don't get a, don't get appointed. Uh, an issue comes to council, the staff has an opinion, council has an opinion, we debate it. First instinct is not, gee, we're not sure, let's go ask, let's go and create a committee and then ask it about this question and then wait for a couple of months while they all get together, meet, get briefed and then come back to us. So the upshot is it simply doesn't happen. It also means, it is the logical outcome of the, of the theory that says your advisory committees only do exactly what you order them to do according to your strategic plan. It means you cut off yourself entirely from any input from the advisory committees with regard to their areas of expertise, whether it's bicyclists telling you should, you should build more bike paths or people who walk on the sidewalks telling you you should enforce your hedge clipping regulations or people who are interested in parks telling you you should have more native plants. Whatever it is, you don't get that advice. And 
to that, in, uh, having been appointed to a time-mandated project-specific citizen advisory committee to help guide the OCP, I feel like my time was, and my input, and the input of all the people around the table was excruciatingly drawn on and used, and I would, like, we would push back, and so I think it, it, if we have it brought it, like Beacon Hill Management Plan, I don't think is a good example, but economic development or you know, whatever our priorities are, if we have a draw together a group of people to work for the next three years on a priority, it doesn't mean that we're asking them for tokenistic advice. It means we're saying, hey, this is important. You've got expertise. Come help us. That's all. Part of what the OCP committee did say is, and here's how we want you to engage the rest of the yeah, community Yeah, that committee was fundamentally responsible for driving, in my humble opinion, uh, at least shaping, anyways, the engagement process. Because we sat down right away and said to staff, it's not going to work to do the same old thing. And staff listened to us and did an amazing job. Anyway, that's all. Uh, Pam, and then others. Well, I certainly agree with Lisa on the OCP. Um, completely different than the other kind of advisory committees that we have seen in the past. That was built in from the beginning. It was part of the project. It was part of the charter. It was all of those things. I really agree with Jeff. What happens with other issues when you want some community input um, and you don't have a committee that's there and is meeting next week, and you've got somebody saying, we've got to get this application through, we can't take the time to strike a committee, it just doesn't happen. But when they're there and they exist, and it's part of our routine of saying, well, they meet on the second whatever, and we've got these things that we can refer to them, it happens. So I think we have to go into this with our eyes open. If we're not going to have these committees, we really are going to be cutting back significantly on the advice that we get from basically volunteers who are seen as um, a, a bit of a litmus test of the community. We've got other kinds of community engagement, but being able to refer to a committee that's there, has some procedural experience, has some experience with whatever the, the topic is, which is what um, Jeff was referring to as well, it's really, really valuable. So I think there's those big picture ones, like you're talking about economic development and the OCP, and absolutely you can build that in and that's going to happen. But when issues come up around a, a GPC table, I cannot imagine the day when there'd be folks saying, yep, let's just stop this and let's form a committee and let's get their advice. So this is the conduit to the public, which is why the advisory committees were first formed a uh, number of decades ago now. And it's that timeliness that I think is really important. I think one of the, um, in my opinion, the advice that I have really seen lacking uh, over the last term was the dissolution of the Advisory Planning Commission. That was such a great body to have to be able to refer land use issues to, to get some opinion and advice. And I have to say, attending the advisory design panel meetings lately specific to Northern Junk they were acting like an advisory planning commission it, because nobody else was. So they really were dealing with the zoning aspects of it because there's no one else who does that. So I've had the, my notes from the beginning of this process saying I'd like to have a discussion about the advisory planning commission. But I think, um, as Jeff has said, if you don't have um, a body in place that you can refer to in a timely way, it just doesn't happen. And I would have to take responsibility as well. I think that we very poorly served the Public Planning Advisory Committee. I feel so badly about how uh, poorly they were supported and how tenuous the link was with Council because they could have done some incredible work. I'm amazed they stuck it out as long as they did because we just didn't do what I felt we should, they sh um, we should have been doing and they didn't have the, uh, the support and they were, Instead of an advisory planning commission, I remember I sort of reluctantly agreed that I would support going to the public planning advisory committee, but with certain provisos in terms of the, what would be referred to them and uh, the kind of uh, professional support they would have, and they just didn't get it. So we lost on, on both sides. So if we're to do away with um, those kind of advisory committees, as I say, I think we have to do it with our eyes open. I know there's been conversations saying, well, we don't need advisory committees anymore because we've got community engagement. I just think that they're, they're um, two parts of a really, um, I guess, a, a really 
meaningful process with the public where you can have the focus of the small group that can respond and then we have our outreach that we, where we get information in other ways. But I just think we need to be really thoughtful about the implications of going to basically um, a task force model. And for all the reasons Jeff gave, because I've just, I've not seen it work successfully unless it's for something of the magnitude that Lisa was describing when it was such a critical part of the OCP. Shelley? Well, it's interesting because I think that the OC, the example you gave, I think Jeff and Pam, we have to learn from that and we need to be flexible and go, okay, how can we modify what took place with the OCP that was so successful and build it into an iteration that we need now? So it's not, it's, it's moving forward, not sticking on what we've been doing for decades that I think is maybe a little bit broken. It's the same people, I don't know a lot about the committees, I'll say that straight off, but I, but I, it seems to be the same people applying for the same committees over and over again, and it, it, it I, and there's some co continuity in that. But I think we should be looking to find maybe forward-thinking examples like the OCP provided us with, and take some what analyze that and go what you was that that was a selected committee. The, I, I think we and we got to change it up a little bit. Fresh eyes are good. Um, I think we need to encourage and engage our public. Boy, oh boy, I get enough emails from experts every day, and I think if they know we didn't have the committees, we might get more people sending out um, information. When we have standing committees, that sort of shuts up the whole segment of the population because somebody else is doing that. There's a, do you know what I mean? Do you get at all? Well, I, I can hear what you're saying. I don't agree, but no, I, I have okay. to hear what you're saying. So I, sure. I, think it's, I think it needs to be, I don't know if this is the time, it's a huge, big discussion. Um, so I, I like I like the mandate specific. I really do like that. And we can still bring people who the same people back to the table that have the experience. But if we look at our strategic priority setting when we have them, and then go, okay, we need people to have from the public and engage the the wealth of knowledge we have in this city on specific issues, but not the same people over and over again doing multi different because they're trying to push through their agendas as well. We've got to be cognizant, I think, that some of those standing committees are trying to push. I mean, the Cycling Coalition, for example, we get a ton of information from them. We don't have a standing committee of cycling people, do we? No, we killed it last term. Well, we can, but we're still getting a tremendous amount of information from them, aren't we? That's right. We rolled it into the uh, environment. Committee. But aren't we getting a lot of information? They have a they have a good voice. They found a way to work through it. They did a big presentation six weeks ago or seven weeks ago on the master plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, help me out here. I'm not sure, but I'm going, wow, that's an example. Uh, that was CRD. That was CRD. Yeah, ah, ah, here we go. yeah I, I confess I'm very torn on this because I'm very attracted to the notion of a mandate-specific body that is focused on a priority or a group of priorities that are, you know, are logically grouped together. Um, but on the other hand, I, I really take a lot of the comments that have been made around the utility of having a smaller group of interested people with relevant backgrounds who are ready to go on urgent things or things that are have a time limited or a time sensitive uh, issue and who also have the ability to although we've limited it to some extent or, or I think we have, uh, to bring forward things that we haven't anticipated mm -hmm. on a, some relevant issue because we're always relying on our residents to not just provide feedback on our own priorities, but to remind us that maybe there are other priorities we haven't yet thought of that might be related to the bigger priorities and all those sorts of things. So I'm attracted to having that ready-to-go kind of resource base. But on the other hand, I'm also cognizant of the fact that this is, this is for me, almost more like a, a focus group or a technical body because I don't think it's necessarily true that the people we appoint to these committees are altogether broadly representative of the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we should consider them to be community representatives on a, the broadest sense of let's do consultation on issue X. And I think to a certain extent that they get kind of frustrated and bored and stale when we don't give them enough to do or we create and make work projects. So, so they're not necessarily being used to their greatest advantage even when they might have really great skills to bring to the table. So I'm almost trying to figure out in my head if there's some way to create almost um, 
an ad hoc kind of function where there'd be an ability to have a pool of people who had really great skills and experience and resources who would almost be on standby. So that that's you'd be crazy. able to say, okay, yeah. we're going to take this group of 30 people. Strangely, and they have this retain one standing pack that can provide advice on any matter referred to it. Right, but or but but yeah. you have to but you have to have it populated with a very diverse group because you want people who had planning experience, you want people who have environment experience, you want people who have a variety of things. So you could. It's almost like you're creating a, uh, when you have a job pool, or you're going to hire one person, but you're, you're not at a point yet where you want to focus down on hiring one person, but you want to create an, uh, a pool of uh, potential applicants, an eligibility pool. So you're almost creating an eligibility pool of resource people to say, here's 30 people, they have this great continuum of experience and interest. You're not going to be called a particular committee, and you're not going to meet on a regular basis. But issue X has arisen, and we would like to pull these six people out of the 30 because they have particularly great expertise. Focus on this for these you know, two to 12 weeks. Make your, your recommendations and then, ta-da, you're done. And then you guys go back. That's on the next page. Yeah, so I mean, that's the one that I think is the most attractive because I think it almost blends mm -hmm. the best part of the, of the, the time existing there. public committees, but it doesn't have them sitting around waiting for us to hand them stuff. So maybe that's... Maybe that's the um, so, so Chris, resolution. Okay, here's what I want to jump in for slightly. In. My observation, historical background is, people used to go down to the mayor's office, this is like 100 years ago, two or three people would get around or in the barber shop and say, hey, we should do this, you know? Um, and, and, and that was the consultation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think David Turner introduced uh, the concept of we need to open up City Hall to hear from more citizens. And, created thousands of, of advisory committees. Uh, oh, sorry, created many advisory committees. Um, Thank you. And that was really welcome because for, I think for a, for a per certain group, it's like, we want to have a voice not just every three years. We want to be able to feed and put in. So that was great. Uh, part of the work that council did last time was to say, and, and we have it, we have a civic engagement strategy. Like, the analogy was a little like, you know, you often you get one youth to sit on your board and that youth represents every youth in the city of Victoria, right? And, and now we're a little bit challenged in saying, you know, that do these six or eight members represent all of that or, or do we have a larger engagement strategy and to a certain extent? We've heard from some of our, uh, you know, that, that people actually don't like us doing the outreach to citizens because they no longer have as much um, input uh, uh, or, or uh, influence. Uh, than they did before when they were just a, a certain uh, group. So uh, I'd almost argue that before we finish this uh, and decide on what's the best one, whether it's one or the other or a hybrid of and all of those, that in this one I'm going to argue a little bit of form following function. Mm -hmm. I, I think when we sit down and say, here's our priorities, now how can mm -hmm. with and with our overarching goal to have civic engagement, how are we going to engage citizens most appropriately is on this issue is it a, an advisory committee sort of type thing or do we have enough of those in an advisory committee needs to be part of that do we have a specific issue that that just cries out for or, or a panel of experts that reflect um, that it's almost like I want to see what the priorities are before I can I want the form to follow the function and the function is is uh, citizen engagement to help direct the, the, the practice of the city so um, are you suggesting we postpone B? Okay. Well, I'm almost suggesting that we keep running in the interim until as we do our priorities. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. that, but, but I also want to reflect that a bit of the reflection was because we did such a civic engagement strategy last term, got so many people involved in everything, that, that we did, for lack of a better term, forget to send stuff to the committees. Because it was either something that was too little. I mean, we didn't want to give them busy work. Here, keep yourself busy, um, but we don't really care what you have to say. Um, so we didn't do that. But then on the really big stuff, we started to put these larger civic engagement strategies together that involved getting hearing from more citizens, right? And so um, part of what I heard is if from some of the advisory committee is maybe our role is to provide that oversight to help you direct, and then also say, how, here's how the, you can engage. So it's less of them giving us their advice and more of the advice on 
within our expertise, we know the groups of how you engage the cycling community, the Sierra Club, the whatever. They help generate that, and because that would then give me what I want, which is uh, confidence that we've got the people that are interested in the issue, uh, the, the greatest uh, input that we want in, in, in a way that we want it. So, well, it's That's almost that, eh? Hey? It's sort of like. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what this says? But uh, so I, to a certain, I mean, we. Uh, but ultimately, to make it easy, I almost want to see what our priorities are, because I think some of them. You, know, you may want standing committees. Other ones, you may want a panel. Others, you may want to. Don't, we're just going to do it. We don't care what people say. We think that that's our priority. That's what I think, Chris. Um, thank you, because I think your comments help frame the larger discussion. I share the concern expressed by Pam and Jeff, and the reason is you have different expectations of the different advisory groups you put in place. A task force is short-term, and panel is short-term. If you go to the OCP folks, they will say it's not as short-term as you think it is. It went on for a much longer period than expected. But it's short-term. They finish, their report comes forward. An advisory committee um, is awkward because they bring forward a recommendation and then they bug you. They say, well, have you implemented it yet? And that's actually really useful for us. It keeps us on track. I've been lucky enough uh, to chair a six-month task force on community and senior centers funding. Um, and it's still a great report. It goes back to 1992 or something like that. Um, I'm not sure it got implemented. Um, it was really interesting discussions every two weeks with 35 people from all the, the seniors and community centers. Really good work. Um, some practical recommendations didn't go very far. Um, also sat on the advisory committee where you got some sandwiches <laughs> and and some mundane stuff done because you just stuck to it. So recognize that I think um, doing away with it and the caution that I think both Pam and Jeff expressed is you'll lose that function and, and be very careful going there because I think that they do add validity to some of the decisions. What we have to do is make sure that they're engaged properly, and I think having them infused into the public engagement strategy is really useful. And yes, I think they enjoyed the sandwiches. Yeah, I served on the environment committee, <coughs> environment shoreline, and the challenge really is the lack of work. Because I think they're in this liminal space trying to please council and play the game and they almost defer to council, and so they end up not, not taking any initiative. And so I almost think, I'd like to see a, ma a way to make it work without having to collapse them, because I think the goal of creating them 20 years ago was a good one. Um, I think I've heard anecdotally that the city's greenways plan came out of the, the old cycling committee. So one option is if it could almost be that they could pick what they're passionate out about out of the city's existing workload almost that they, they gravitate. Like we could refer issues, but if they almost had a function, that if there's like, for example, we never referred the Beacon Hill management plan to, to environment. But just trying to think how can they find work to do. And I think if they maybe find it themselves by pining through GPC agendas and council agendas, and then they can run with an issue, they can inform us that for the next three months they're going to do a detailed inquiry, that might be so but the difficulty is we have a meeting though, and group, right? All before the previous term. Yeah, I mean, they, they did that, they sat out, it was about having all the community people interest. So, again, it's one of those ones about you have that community group and then right. say, but now we're going to give it to these nine people. So, Parks' report came after the end of that. Yeah, there was a whole consultation. 2001. Oh, geez, that wasn't in the report. Yeah, oh, huge. Oh, huge. Okay. Mr. Woodland? Yeah. And then Lisa? I been here for a while, so <laughs> not today. Just well, and today. And today. And today. And today. And today. And today. So my observation is um, the, the public advisory committees are filled with people with energy and desire to add value. Um, but every uh, council that I've worked with falls victim to the same problem. They they don't give them enough work to do, and they wither on the vine, and, and eventually you hear the concerns that we've heard uh, recently from them. So, you know, the objective from the staff's point of view is if we're going to have them, we need to meaningfully engage them in your priorities, because if you don't 
engage them in your priorities, they will develop their, their own priorities, many of which you won't share as a priority. And so the same problem arises. They wither on the vine because they're ignored because what they're doing isn't valued by the people who give direction to the organization. So whatever you want to do with them, I, I guess my, my plea to you is provide them with some meaningful work to do so that they engage and feel valued and all that sort of stuff. So, um, I'm not certain whether letting them develop those on their own is going to work because ultimately those those priorities that they think of may not be shared by you by the group around the table that makes the final decisions and then that results in them withering on the minds. Mm. I think the other thing that happens sometimes is they get into realms that are not city services. And that's happened in the past, and we don't have the resources or even the expertise to support them in it. And we've had a, had a few instances where we've had to do a fair amount of work around issues that we have no authority over. Uh, Lisa, I think you're so I think the, the, what the big question here, we've been talking about it in terms of standing committees, but what's the best way to get input from the public? Right? It's not mm -hmm. about how we make work or don't make work for these committees or who's been on them or who hasn't or how long they've been here and how long they haven't. We're trying to get input from the public. And so there's a motion on the table and I actually don't think we should defer this to our priority session because I think we need to make some decisions that will help us inform our priorities in terms of how we're going forward. So the motion is to convene mandate specific time limited PACs. But the next motion, I mean, the next recommendation is to retain one standing committee PAC that can provide advice on any matter referred to it. So maybe the, if if we move in this order, we could, the first thing refer to it is say, here are our priorities. What's the best way to engage the public on these priorities? So use, use, the, use the proposal to find out what the best way is to go forward with our priorities and to engage the public to do that. So I think, I think deferring decisions is not useful because we need to make decisions and move forward, even though it feels hard. Or it might not, or I don't know. It doesn't seem uh, what's easier though to do? Hmm? So I So it only can be mandate specific time limited PACs. So one A two. Yeah, and then one B to retain one standing PAC that can provide advice on any matter referred to it. And then da 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 the rest follows from time. Yeah, that's that's so you have the expertise in every area that you might or in the interest, forget the expertise on that committee. I'd just like to have an understanding of is it going to be a pool of like 80 people and you pick six for the particular issue? Or what, I, I, it, what it says is retain who can provide an advice on any matter referred to it. And I'm suggesting that we might say the first matter is decide how we want, how we can engage the public on our priorities. And then there may flow other mandates, time specific committees out of that. I don't think we go out and convene a panel tomorrow. I think we pass the motion, set our priorities, and say how is the best way for us to use this one standing PAC? Other time-specific, mandate-specific ones might flow out of it. So I, I actually like that idea, and I just have some questions, I guess, on process. So if we approve this today, but we agree not to populate this committee until we have had some clarity on our priorities, what happens to the existing PACs? And do we tell them that they're being dissolved and that their members may or may not be added in the future to a resource pool? Yeah, and just, be, yeah, I mean, yes, and just because the committee is disbanded doesn't stop you from being engaged in all no, of no. the, uh, yeah. No, I'm just saying, so So if we if we did this, we would essentially say to our existing, uh, the three existing PACs, okay, we're in the process of transition, so our existing PACs are going to be stood down, but all of you are going to be essentially kept on file as potential members of a new resource pack, an all-purpose resource pack. But we're not going to confine that at this point until we do our priorities. So just take a breath and we'll get back to you, essentially. Yeah, that's... Okay. Just wanted to make sure, my head just wanted to clarify. Okay, Ben? I, um, I think maybe a preferable way to proceed is that we're talking probably about a dozen people who would agree to continue to serve because they have had a they have a bad taste in their mouth. From I went to the community development committee and they feel they're doing nothing. And they had like six people talking in circles. So I think a way to manage the transition is roll any members who want to continue to serve into a new pack, 
give them a six month time frame, let them know that there'll be a fresh appointments and they can re-offer. I think that's just a more respectful way to acknowledge that they've been serving the city for some time now. And I don't think it would, it doesn't even have to have a ne the next me meeting schedule, but why not let a rump of 12 form the nucleus of a future committee? Because they are hardworking people, they have strong commitment to the city, to the organization. It's respectful. It's, and it, we're not re going from scratch, rather than sort of snubbing our noses and say thank you, bye, we're completely launching on a new course. Well, to dissolve it and tell them that they're done. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't suggest that. Well, no, I'd be uh, disrespectful too. But if it's dissolved with no cost of ability, that's how it might be interpreted. But, but to be accurate, what I suggested was that the committee structures be dissolved and that they be advised that, they're, that they would be retained for a future appointment to a resource pool. So they're not, you're not saying, thanks so much, take a hike. You're saying our current structure is changing. We're going to keep you on file and we'll be back to you when we're firm on what our structure looks like. Thank you very much for your service, and we hope you'll still be interested. So that's that's not what I suggested. Yes, we will. So uh, the way it's set up, the terms of the committees expire June thirtieth of this year. So there is a winding down. <laughs> there's a winding down that occurs. What we will be doing between now and then is developing whatever terms of reference it is for whatever committees that council wishes, publicizing that, going through the recruitment process encouraging existing members to reapply to whatever the new committees are mm -hmm. and transitioning just through our normal procedures to that point. So that's what would flow out of this. It wouldn't happen overnight. It'll happen to time out with this process of advertising, recruiting, selecting, mm -hmm. doing the terms of reference, bringing the other changes back to council. It takes a couple of weeks. So council, uh, actually reconvene them as a group again mm -hmm. and say here's where we're moving can we get your input on how to make this work because you've been on committees and you've been that way let's you know and, and that way they can help shape what that's going to look like because they'll be part of the transition and that's just something that I would undertake and invite all council to come to again and just say okay guys what do you think because they are good citizens mm -hmm. that want to help shape them and so if we can build this with their thoughts in mind because they have experience of sitting here so uh, I think that's what we could do as well Um, I'm still tr I'm trying to understand uh, point four on page three, um, member recruitment. Uh, to me, it makes no sense because what's being described in the middle box is actually what happens now. I mean, people apply, but then their council makes decisions based on their expertise and their ability to work together and all of that. And I heard some comments earlier that sounded as if we wouldn't be soliciting people's interest, but rather we would be identifying people and bringing them to a table. So I just want some clarification on what the, um, the recruitment process would be. Well, my understanding is, I mean, there, there's sort of like two there. There's, there's sort of the, the lay person, um, that, uh, and then you may want to panel with people that have more technical expertise related to the subject matter of your priority. Uh, so for example, when we sat around the bridge, we said, we need some designers. We need some people who do bikes and pedestrians. We need someone from Johnson Street Bridge to our com in there who was an added them into it. I mean, there was people involved on that that provided a level of expertise that could feed back to our staff. And so, you know, we actually, so some committees, you may want to say, we need some expert opinion or, or, or focus. Other ones, it's like, you're not here to argue with staff about what's the right thing to do. You're here to be the citizens that provide that oversight, right? It's not about having experts keep working for free. It's more about that layperson citizen engagement stuff. So. But that still doesn't answer my question about regardless of whether people would be able to apply and then they would be, uh, uh, you know, judged on, on, on what council is looking for or whether it's all going to come from council to the public. That's what I'm trying to understand and that didn't clarify that for me because they're not mutually exclusive. They don't need to be. Because with advisory committees in the past, anybody can encourage someone to apply, you know, for 
for this as well. So I'm with you, but why don't we just keep what's on there? Committee candidates are selected based on the qualifications, ability to work in the committee members. Any problem? Sure well, it just because it seems to suggest it's a different process than what we've had, and the one in the past had been that you, you can apply. Mr. Whittle. So I just want to make sure how we get people. I think all it was intended was that you would try to balance membership so that you didn't have eight lawyers yeah. or ten architects or whatever, but you were trying to get a different trying to get different perspectives or different expertise or whatever. Diversity of thought. But that is the current practice. That's why I was confused oh. about whether or not it was going to be City Hall looking out and saying, I need this person and this person and this person versus advertising for people and saying, these are the skills we're looking for, like on the board of directors, exactly. Yeah. You could do that. <coughs> you certainly could do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I know the board of variants, uh, because it needs specific skill sets, when they lose somebody, we do put an advertisement in to say, we're looking for somebody with yeah. these kind of skill sets. So it's a That's all I want to make sure we don't lose. Just given the time, and I think we're all going to agree that that's okay and that's what we intend. So Wait, I have a process question. Okay, thank you. Mary Ann, and Lisa, then I thought that the motion that Lisa had put forward that I think we approved was that we convene the mandate specific and then we retain the big population. It hasn't been voted on here. Oh, okay. Because my question around process was yeah. if we approve that, the very first thing that you suggested, I think, as part of your motion was that we do our priorities and then go back to them and say, here's our priorities, how best do you think we should engage the public? Which means if we make decisions on all the rest of these things before we have that conversation with them, we're prejudging the outcome. I agree. I didn't. I thought we were only voting on, like, that's why I was confused when Councillor Maddox started asking about how we're going to select them, because I think um, the only thing I put on the table is two, which goes into the second page. So the motion as it stands and the technical PACs are both renamed as panels. Uh, you moved 1B. Um, yeah, yeah, I did, but not 2, 3, 4. Like, I'm, I moved. She didn't move 1A. 1A and, 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 yeah. She's so only moved the first two clauses because yeah. if, if we pass the first two clauses, it would be premature for us to lay out in such detail the rest of the process because we've just said that we approve that we want to look to these people for advice. So, in fact, the answer to your question is we don't know yet. And uh, what I was doing was basically a testing of the water of what is the the sense that people have, because when you look to consider 1B, for me it was really useful to know, well, as then we move down, great, I support that, we move further down and I discover, oh, guess what, we're not going to allow people to apply, mm -hmm. for example. So I was just, I wasn't suggesting we were making, we were voting on those at this point, I'm trying to understand the, mm -hmm. the frame of mm -hmm. thinking behind the consideration of that one, because it's fundamental to how we populate task forces or committees or whatever they are. Yeah, and I guess that if my motion is specific, like what I specifically said is retain one standing PSC that can provide us advice on any matter referred to it, and that the first matter be how to engage the public on our priorities. Mm -hmm. That's that's the motion. So if there's an, it's there's it's added to what's written here, and then mm -hmm. I would I think that's a great point, Pam. That then we say, okay, well, do you think people should apply? Do you mm -hmm. think they should be appointed? Does it like if we're asking? This is funny. Mm -hmm. no, sorry. No, Charlie was telling me that Rob had his hand up, but I said I know what Lisa's talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm done talking. I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that not any matter referred to it. That's too general a motion. I'm just mm -hmm. saying specifically. And I agree that the stuff falls out. Yeah. Sort of. So re recommendation 1B was meant to capture four things. A standing public advisory committee, which would be your, we call it a citizen advisory committee. The retention of advisory design panel and heritage advisory panel. Uh, committee, but rename them as panels so they're distinct, and also to establish mandate specific time limit. Yeah. Great, that's the intention of what I'm okay, putting so on the table. Okay, so 1B is on the table. 1A2 isn't, because it's actually captured in 1B, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So we're moving forward with 1B. All those in favor? Opposed? Young and Coleman opposed? Um, I'm sorry, Dean, I have a meeting at home. Yeah, no, no, we're there because everything else will flow out of. I was supposed to start on that one. Thank you. Like the back. 1A2. Okay. Yes, we're going to call a halt to it, so go ahead, questions. If we don't decide for what committee is going to, are we going to refer the matter to? How will it be composed? The one that's. 
But but who? How are we going to pick who serves on that? Didn't we just say it's we're going to ask the people who are currently serving to make these? Uh, that was an idea, but I don't think that's that's not embodied in any motion we've approved. I'd have to make that motion. Yeah. Uh, then I would suggest that the uh, one standing public advisory committees referenced in the earlier motion be initially comprised of those members willing to participate who are currently appointed to the other three standing uh, public advisory committees. Stranger, they'll be in place until the end of June. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Notwithstanding that we could add to them, right? but yeah. not, not just them. Yeah. Are we in favor? Opposed? That's it for today. Motion to adjourn.